Alleluia, alleluia, Christ was revealed in flesh and proclaimed among the nations and believed in throughout the world. Alleluia. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory be to you, O Lord. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to be baptized with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Kephas, which is translated Peter. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Here is the Lamb of God that takes away, who takes away the sin of the world. This remark of John the Baptist is so familiar, so part of our liturgy, that we forget what an odd thing it is for him to say. <clears throat> John has his own group of disciples, his own team, and they, like him, understand themselves to be preparing the way for God's chosen one, the Messiah. The concept of this Messiah, or in Greek, Christ, this Messiah, was expected to save God's beloved people from domination by a foreign and heretical power and set them free to worship God faithfully without all the compromises imposed by the idolatrous culture of the occupying Romans. But when in John's Gospel, John the Baptist moves beyond the concept of Messiah and sees Jesus in person for the first time, he sees something different. When he finally sees Jesus in the flesh, in person, John the Baptist's response is, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what has happened? Upon actually seeing the person of Jesus in the flesh, not an abstract theological idea about a Messiah or a Christ, John suddenly understands that Jesus will take away the sin of all women and men, everybody. The work of Christ will not be restricted to God's beloved people, the Jews. 
John also calls to mind an almost forgotten saying by the prophet Isaiah, uttered hundreds of years before and from our first reading from the Hebrew scriptures this morning. Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel? I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. The prophet understood that God would set no limits on salvation. All are to be saved, even those at the ends of the earth, even those in Oxford, even those uh, like you or like me. And this is not some sort of Old Testament versus New Testament thing, and that's one of my least favorite ways of approaching the Bible, by the way, and it's not a good way to engage with it. In any case, um, as though the New Testament is some sort of corrective lens for the Hebrew scriptures. Isaiah 2 offers us God without limits. And this lifting of limits, this refusal of limits by God is what John the Baptist recognizes in Jesus in our gospel reading today. No one, no place, no time is beyond the loving reach of Christ. So, all our lies, all our failures, all our misunderstandings, all our cruelty, petty and not so petty, all our getting it wrong, all the sin of the world with all our suffering is born and brought into reconciliation and forgiveness by Christ without limits. That simply is the good news. Now, John the Baptist's new way of seeing disturbed his own followers, upset his own team, who we learned just a little later in John's gospel, found it hard to trust Jesus initially. He was just too radical. Could God really ignore, set aside, not give a fig for all the limits which we impose on one another? Could God really set aside the distinction between Jew and Gentile? male and female, slave and free. Would this not lead to chaos and confusion? But John insists, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now there's a deep strain in our culture of which the church is part. And in fact, in some ways, the church is one of its chief enablers that seeks to condemn. In fact, if we're honest that positively enjoys a bit of condemning. It's a thrill, a buzz, a charge out of condemnation and shaming people. Wherever you are in your faith, it's sobering to think about the human capacity for exclusion, for shaming, and for really rather enjoying it. Whatever pious utterances we make about it being good for the people, I'm doing this for your sake, uh, that we are shaming and condemning. Now, this is the um, nerdy Church of England obsessed part of my sermon. So if you are not a nerdy Church of uh, England obsessed person, you can kind of tune out now. But I, but I hope you'll just hang in with me, and I'm almost done anyway. As some of you know, I'm a member of the General Synod of the Church of England. In fact, I'm in uh, the third of of my five year, uh, I mean, the, the, my third term, and the terms are five years, so yes, that, that's where I am. And uh, Will often refers to me as taking it one for the team, which I appreciate him saying so. Now, in early February, this February, the Synod will meet to discuss proposals from the House of Bishops and how to move out of the cul-de-sac of hypocrisy and double standards we have on human sexuality in the church. We don't know, and I know it's the 15th of January, but we don't know yet what those proposals are. They are supposed to be the result of a process of study and listening that has been going on for a number of years now. I gather something will be published on the 20th of January for Synod to consider when it has its meeting on the 5th of January. February. Yes, that, and that's not very much time. So will it be, will we get from the bishop a call to maintain the institutional homophobia of the church, 
but just be a bit nicer about it. The bishops tried that a, a few years ago, and um, Synod voted not to take note of their report. That's a very Anglican form of dissent, but uh, that's what we did. We voted not to take note. And that, in fact, started the whole process of what we call now call Living in Love and Faith, LLF. Or will we see the needle moved in the inclusive direction, such as our own Bishop Stephen bravely, I think, put forward in the autumn? We don't know. Even my own extensive spy network that I have built up over decades in the Church of England is not giving me much to go on. Our church is a lot like the muddled disciples of John the Baptist because we spend a great deal of energy on fixing the limits of love and grace in the church rather than energy on how to increase them. It is hard not to do. Jesus' own disciples reveal themselves to be pretty good at that too, however many times Jesus tries to get through to them. Like John the Baptist, we seek that moment where we move beyond the concept to seeing the real person in the flesh. Christians have, at a very fundamental level, received a commission from Christ which is absolutely clear. No limits on grace. And the discipleship of the church, which means us, is about working that out. So, whether you're a Church of England nerd or no, your prayers, please, for the General Synod in early February. Amen. We stand to profess our faith in God. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us worship the Saviour with joy and make our prayer to our Heavenly Father. Loving Father, you have known us from before we were born. You call us by name as your beloved children. Give us the grace, humility and courage to accept your love and to, to ground our lives in it as we step into this new year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Light of the nations, we bring before you the conflict and chaos of our world, the pain of families who have lost loved ones, homes, livelihoods in war, and are without heat in the cold of winter. We pray particularly for Ukraine and Afghanistan. The distress of those whose lives have been destroyed by natural disasters and by fires, floods and drought caused by climate change. We pray particularly for Pakistan 
and East Africa. The anger of those who believe their voices are not being heard and who overturn democratic processes. We pray particularly for Brazil and the United States. We ask you to sustain, guard, and guide all who work for peace and justice and all who challenge corruption and discrimination. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, our strength, we bring before you the conflict and chaos in our own country, the trauma of a health service stretched to breaking point, the stress of doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, care workers, the suffering of people waiting for treatment, the pain of their relatives and friends. We remember all those who are on strike and all those affected by the strikes. We remember all those who are struggling to feed their families and to keep warm. We remember all refugees and asylum seekers who have come here looking for sanctuary and whose needs sometimes have not been met. We pray for our political leaders that they will meet these challenges with compassion wisdom, imagination, generosity, and far-sightedness. And we ask that you will show us whatever part we can play. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, our salvation, as the week of prayer for Christian unity begins, we pray for your church all over the world as it works to transform society to reflect your kingdom. We pray, too, for our brothers and sisters of other faiths. We thank you for the clergy, staff, and volunteers who contribute so generously to our life here at St. Mary's. And we pray for all who worship here and all who visit. Show us how to play our role in addressing the, need, the needs of this city. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, our refuge, we pray for healing and comfort for those who are sick, that they will know your love and presence in their troubles. We pray for all who care for them, and in, particularly, and in particular we remember Trish, Jenny, Betty, Nick, Yaroslava, Ian, Moose, all shine on them, and grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our peace. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, Everything has become new. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Word made flesh, life of the world. In your incarnation, you embraced our poverty. By your spirit, may we share in your riches. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. All honour and praise be yours, always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For at this time we celebrate your glory, made present in our midst. In the coming of the Magi, the King of all the world was revealed to the nations. Proclaim the glory of your name and sing our joyful hymn of praise. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. 
He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. How many? We are one body because we all share in one bread. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. God of glory, you nourish us with your word who is the bread of life. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that through us the light of your glory may shine in all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Will you please be seated? It's very good to welcome you to St. Mary's this morning, particularly if you're joining us for the first time. Please do join us for refreshments over in the De Broom Chapel immediately after the service. You'll be very welcome. I want to say a word of thanks to all those who helped with the Christmas services this year. It was a huge effort in terms of stewarding, welcoming, flower arranging, music, and all sorts of other things behind the scenes that make everything work smoothly. It's very much appreciated, so a big thank you. Next Sunday, there will be a parish lunch in the old library. If you are willing to help with the lunch, please do have a word with Katie Hicks after the service. Um, and you've got details in the back of the order of service if you want to draw, drop her a line by email. There are lots of things starting up this week with the beginning of the university term. Uh, note the book club on Thursday evening and the Bible study on Friday lunchtime, as well as the lunchtime concert on Thursday. 
Further information about all these events can be found in the new edition of What's On. Please take a copy of this away with you if you haven't got one already. And if you have a neighbour or a friend who might be interested in our life together, please take one for them too. On Friday evening, there is a concert with our ensemble in residence, Stile Antico. Um, the title of the concert is England's Nightingale, and this celebrates William Byrd's 400th anniversary this year. Uh, tickets have gone very, very quickly, so if you would like a ticket for that concert, please do make sure that you purchase one online. Now, this afternoon, there'll be the Latin Litany and University Sermon. Um, it does sound a little bit mad to have uh, a sermon still preached in Latin every year, and Father Max Kramer, the chaplain of Keeble College, will be the preacher, so he's the one that's taken the hit for the team this year. Everyone is welcome to attend. It's perhaps one of the more rarefied traditions in the University of Oxford, um, but it's rather wonderful that we do this, um, even if it's slightly crazy all at the same time. Will you please stand? Just before we go out with God's blessing, there is one final notice, and that is to say that a number of us yesterday were delighted to join Will at Christchurch Cathedral as he was made an honorary canon. And to celebrate that, there'll be some drinks and a rather fabulous cake. So please do join us for that. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory, and glad in your hearts with the good news of his kingdom, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.